Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the second part of our um, Black Box webinar series um, focusing on developing mental fitness in the face of unexpected challenges. Um, we're just going to let everyone else join in here over the next couple of minutes and then we'll get started. So maybe before we get started, I'll just do a quick tech check and um, ask if a few people could just let me know in the question section that they can in fact hear me and uh, see the slides. And that way I'll know for sure I'm not just talking to myself here. <laughs> Perfect. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. I have to say that doing webinars, the most bizarre part of it is speaking to an audience that you can't actually see. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting experience. So it's lovely to see you all writing back. It makes me feel like I'm, as I said, not just here chatting away to myself. <laughs> Perfect. All right, let's do a quick time check here. Here we are, three o'clock on the dot. So we're going to dive in and get started. So once again, thank you so much, everybody, for coming back for part two of our series. Um, I'm hosting this series in collaboration with Black Box Fitness, um, which is a great company I'm sure you're all familiar with, based in Belfast. Um, my own business is called Mind Aware Performance. I work as a sport and exercise psychology consultant, and so the bulk of my work um, consists of helping people work through any kind of mental or psychological blocks that might be preventing them from reaching the outcomes that they're looking for, whether that's in a sport context or a fitness context, or also in a, in a, in a business context. And um, a big part of that is often around dealing with challenges, dealing with anxiety. And so that's where the idea for this webinar series came together in light of the, um, the pretty crazy world events that we're all facing. So last week we talked about uh, mindset and anxiety, and this week we are going to dive into the topic of building self-awareness. So I thought we'd start off with a, with a great quote here. When we come to the topic of self-awareness, um, usually what brings us to the idea of, of trying to develop our self-awareness further is an interest in change. Usually we're interested in changing something about ourselves, maybe improving something. Um, and so it's really interesting to consider this quote, which says that what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. And what it suggests is that really who we are as people is, is completely uh, wrapped up in who we see ourselves to be. And so um, developing self-awareness is sort of the process of figuring out who, how do you see yourself and um, how do other people see you? And then through that enhanced awareness, we start to be able to do the really cool work of, of changing and developing aspects of ourselves. Um, towards whether that's towards improvement um, for ourselves personally or improvement in relationships or just an interest in kind of a continued continued development through life. So last week we talked about this idea of mental fitness as being a combination of many factors. Um, and I mentioned that there's a lot of sort of foundational skills and concepts that are, we need to cover and sort of develop before we can get to that sort of end goal of resilience, which is this idea that we're just like really, really um, able to come through any challenge, any sort of difficult situation that life throws at us, um, that we're able to come through stronger and more capable than we were before. Um, so resilience is often the goal. 
And what we want to sort of facilitate along that journey towards resilience is all the other skills that are going to form the foundation for us to be able to um, be truly resilient. So we talked about mindset last week. And um, the cool thing about mindset is it's one of the, the first sort of windows into developing what I see as sort of the, the link between the foundational skills and the higher level skills, which is self-awareness. And by starting to dig into the concept of mindset and looking at how we sort of choose to perceive the events around us and which mindset we're applying to those events, it starts to give us a little bit of a window into self-awareness and um, starts to kind of teach us to take a step back from our own minds and have a look at how we're thinking and reacting and start to think about those thoughts. So this is a process called um, sort of being metacognizant. So this is this idea that you are able to think about your own thoughts or observe your own thinking. Um, and that is really at the core of self-awareness. So that's what we're going to focus in on today. So building self-awareness is a really sort of ongoing, long, um, possibly never-ending process. And I think it's something that we engage in um, throughout our entire lives and that there's a lot of value in seeing it as a process that is ongoing. Um, you've probably never come across someone who is you know, perfectly and, and uh, um, utterly self-aware to the point where there's sort of nothing else that they can learn about themselves. Um, and so it's, it's always great. And I always frame it this way to clients that this isn't something that you're going to check off your list and then move on from. This is going to be something that we will continue to engage in throughout our lives for better and better outcomes. So when we're thinking about self-awareness, so this idea of how we see ourselves, the, um, the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves um, really forms the foundation of how we see ourselves as people and how we see ourselves fitting into the context of our lives. And so this overall story is very much informed by the automatic thoughts or the self-talk that we engage in on a daily basis throughout our lives. So these are thoughts that sort of come into our head almost um, unsolicited, it, it seems sometimes. Um, they're sometimes positive, they're sometimes negative, um, they're sometimes self-deprecating. And um, whatever they are, they are, they're always ongoing. It's very hard to turn off these thoughts. They really form the sort of background chatter that exists in our minds. And so these thoughts play a really important role in how we see ourselves. Um, but there's a sort of a, another layer back to these thoughts. And what informs these thoughts is our sort of set of core beliefs about who we are as people. And so really it's the core beliefs that um, inform this overall story of how we see ourselves and, and um, the way that we understand ourselves. And so for me, the, the place to really start when we're trying to think about developing self-awareness is to go back to those core beliefs and try to get a sense of what our core beliefs are and how they may be helping us or potentially hindering us in our, um, in our process, whatever we're engaging in. So these core beliefs are really powerful. They usually start uh, when, or they're usually formed, I should say, when we're children. And we tend to um, accept them as real sort of true facts about ourselves. And so at the end of the day, we may not even see it as a belief that we have. We may see it as actually something that we just believe to be 100% true of fact about ourselves. We'll dive into that a little bit more um, in a moment. Um, so essentially, we can have a lot of really positive beliefs. So for example, you could believe that you are ultimately a kind person. You could believe that you are a smart person. Uh, you could believe that you are creative. Um, and we all have different really positive beliefs about ourselves that are, again, formed usually in our, early in our lives and then reinforced by the experiences that we have throughout our life. Um, but the problem is that we can also form negative core beliefs about ourselves. We can form beliefs like um, I'm stupid or a belief like um, I am not lovable. And so these types of beliefs are what we actually end up calling uh, limiting beliefs because they're beliefs that prevent us from 
um, sort of fulfilling our, our full potential in certain areas. So the thing about these limiting beliefs is that they feel like they are 100% true. Again, they feel like fact. Um, but the interesting thing is that more often than not, they're actually not true. So they feel like something that's a part of your identity, again, um, as opposed to, so say coming back to the idea of creativity, if you have a limiting belief around creativity, then you probably believe that you're not a creative person. So it really becomes like a part of your identity. And that belief then informs the way that you think about yourself in creative context. When you come up against something, a challenge that requires sort of a creative element to it, because you have the core belief that you're not a creative person, you're likely to have um, fearful um, self-talk or, or automatic thoughts, things like, I can't do it, I'm not good enough, um, and that then continues to inform um, our story that we have about ourselves, where we are a person who doesn't engage in creative things and isn't able to um, think creatively. creatively. So these beliefs, they don't make it impossible for us to succeed. Uh, to succeed. Like people who have um, can have many limiting, limiting beliefs and still sort of do well in their lives, they don't completely choke us from any success. But what they do do is that they really limit us from reaching our full potential. So for those of you who were here last week and we were talking about mindset, the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, our limiting beliefs are really tied into that fixed mindset. And we tend to have a fixed mindset about our limiting beliefs. Um, and it's the same idea that they really prevent us from seeing our own potential in, in a particular area. So just quickly before we move on to well-being, um, the whole uh, the, sort of the value in, in understanding the idea of core beliefs and limiting beliefs is that it allows us to start having sort of taking a step back and taking a look at our own beliefs. So what you can do is sort of follow your automatic thoughts backwards to find your beliefs. So if you have find yourself thinking a lot to yourself, um, that I can't do it in whatever given context. There may be some sort of particular uh, challenge or type of challenge that whenever you encounter it, you have a, this sort of thought or sense that you can't do it. So what's really interesting is to follow that thought in that context back into yourself and think, okay, what is the belief that's sort of informing that thought? And then once you've identified the belief, you can question it and think, okay, is this, is this true? Is this a limiting belief? And if you discover that it's a limiting belief, then you can start to engage in the process of, of changing that um, and creating a much more empowering belief for yourself, which will um, really affect the way they were able to, to handle that particular situation that was so challenging. Okay, so when we're bringing uh, self-awareness over to the idea of well-being, what's really useful is to consider that there are actually sort of three core pillars to well-being. Um, and we have a certain amount of awareness or lack of awareness around each of these three uh, pillars. So when we're looking at um, well-being, we see that we have autonomy, which is essentially our ability to control things in our lives and our sense of choice. And then we have the idea of competence, which is essentially um, mastery, the, the idea that we're able to do the things that we want to be able to do, that we are able to succeed at things that we want to succeed at, which is really, really important for our, um, for our sense of well-being. And then lastly, we have this idea of relatedness, or which is also um, considered to be sort of a sense of belonging or connection, so sort of the social aspect. Um, and so it kind of creates this triangle of, of wellness. And if we're lacking in one area, even if we're strong in the other two, we can still sometimes not have a sense of being really well or having a sort of a high well-being. If we're lacking in two areas, it's even worse. And sometimes we can be lacking in all three. Um, but usually it just it, usually it's just one area or maybe two that people are struggling a little bit in and that is sort of impacting their sense of well-being. So when we're bringing self-awareness to this, um, it can be really interesting to think about if there's something in your life that you feel is really impacting your well-being, it's really kind of dragging it down or um, causing a lot of struggle for you, to think about which of these categories that it, um, does it fall into. Is it something around you not having control or choice over your 
uh, situation? Is it something that you feel like you can't um, you can't uh, learn how to do properly or you don't have the opportunity to learn or you're failing in a certain area where you really want to be successful and have the mastery? Um, or maybe is it related to um, a social aspect uh, and building a lack of belonging or a lack of connection? And so by being able to categorize it into these three um, areas, it gives us a lot more information about how we can then go about potentially um, fixing that problem or improving that situation so that we have um, the ability to then improve our well-being. So another area that's um, obviously a big one for, for all of us involved in the fitness industry is motivation. And so again, when we're trying to bring more motivation to the, the topic, sorry, when we're trying to bring more self-awareness to the topic of motivation, it's, it's really helpful to sort of understand what the underlying um, framework is. Um, and so that we can sort of see what areas maybe we're lacking in. So when we think about motivation, we think about it existing on a scale. So we go from um, having absolutely no motivation all the way up to what we call intrinsic motivation, which is um, when you're motivated to do something like for the pure love of the activity, something you just really, really love to do. So I have spent my whole life being an equestrian athlete and for me, the, the motivation to, to do that, to sort of take on that, what is you know, a pretty intense and all-consuming lifestyle, caring for and competing horses, was always drawn from this sense of intrinsic motivation because I just absolutely love riding horses and I love being around horses. Um, but having said that, you know, even if you have that overall driving um, motivation, which may be um, responsible for your continued involvement in an activity over a period of time, there's still mornings where, you know, the alarm goes off at 6 a.m. and you've got to get up and muck out six stalls and you just have no motivation in that moment, right? You just want to curl up and go to bed and, and ignore that alarm. And that happens to all of us. Um, we don't, our, our intrinsic motivation is strong and it pulls us through the long term, but we always experience dips and, um, and valleys of motivation throughout our life. It's supernatural. And so that's because in the, in the middle here between the, the two ends of the spectrum is what we call extrinsic or external motivation. And there's a lot of different types of external motivation, but essentially the idea is that we're being motivated by either a reward, the idea that we're going to gain a reward, or we're being motivated um, to avoid a punishment. And so this type of motivation is really useful for those in between moments. So even though I love horses and I you know I'm really committed to the lifestyle, when that alarm goes off at 6 a.m., if I'm not feeling the motivation in that moment, what's actually really going to get me out of bed is, is something external. So it's going to be the idea that if I don't get up and muck up those stalls, someone else is going to see that I haven't done that and is going to be really critical of me. So that's an external motivator. I'm motivated to get up and do the activity because I don't want somebody else to think poorly of me. So I'm avoiding a punishment or avoiding a negative. Um, so this is a quick example of kind of how that can play out in a, in a normal circumstance. But what's important is to bring some self-awareness to how we're being motivated in any given situation. Um, it's interesting to consider yourself and think about identifying what your own intrinsic uh, motivators are. What are the things that you really actually just love doing for the sake of doing that you would do for no reward and where you're not concerned about avoiding punishment? And what are the things that you do enjoy doing um, but that you need a little bit of extra help um, potentially to, to fully engage in sometimes? And so when you bring awareness to that, you can start to understand um, where the motivation is coming from and you can also start to sort of influence your own motivation and apply that extrinsic motivation to yourself when you potentially need it the most at the end of the day one of the, the you know the the most powerful forms of motivation and the, and the way that it really ties in in my opinion to self-awareness is bringing um, the source of the motivation back to your own identity so at the end of the day it comes back to this idea of who do you want to be? What is important to you about how you show up? So if I um, want to be the type of person who takes really good care of her horses and always cleans out their stalls first thing in the morning, and that's an important part of my identity, being a responsible 
um, person who you know prioritizes her horse's care, then I'm much more likely to um, get up again out of bed um, even when the sense of motivation is is low. And so it's important to consider our identity around things that we're trying to motivate ourselves to do. So if we're trying to motivate ourselves to exercise more or engage in a different form of exercise, then it's really interesting to, to kind of take a step back and reflect on who your identity is around that activity. Do you want to be the type of person who is able to run 5K three days a week, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so that can really bring it home. And in order to figure out what your identity is around that, um, it requires a certain amount of reflection and, and sort of a building of that self-awareness. So I just wanted to throw in this here, given you know the context. We talked a lot about um, anxiety last week and how it can be really, really powerful in situations like the one we're facing now, where there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of change, rapid change, that is sort of continuing um, day to day. So one of the really cool things, or one of the really cool tricks that you can use to um, tackle anxiety within the context of self-awareness is to try to stay curious try to bring a level of curiosity to your own feeling of anxiety. So what that means is to sort of question um, what your, where your anxiety is coming from when you feel it. So it's that idea of taking a step back from your own feelings of anxiety and looking at it and thinking, okay, that's interesting. I'm feeling really anxious about this. Um, can I trace that feeling of anxiety then back to the core belief that's feeding it? So if we're feeling super, super stressed out about the sort of lack of, of certainty around potentially um, our, our business in this time. Um, it'd be interesting to go back and look at that core belief and think, okay, do I really believe that I'm the type of person who can um, manage unexpected challenges? Do I believe that about myself? Am I someone who is able to adapt? Am I, do I believe that I'm someone who is able to adapt or not? And again, we can sort of then take a look at those beliefs and decide if they're limiting us or not and take action. So the cool thing about thoughts and feelings is that um, they're actually partially habits in the same way that small actions that we take through the day are. So we all we form habits about everything in our life. And that's because it's a really effective trick that our brain does to kind of streamline the process of getting through the day. If we had to think deeply about every small action or thought or, or emotion that we had through the day, our brain would be completely overwhelmed. So instead, the brain kind of forms these quick systems or habits that enable us to do things sort of almost without much uh, conscious thought. Um, and where this can sometimes get us into trouble is that we also form habits around the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that we react to situations, um, who we think we are, how we think other people view us, all of those things can also be influenced by habits. And so if we aren't aware of this, um, we can get sort of pulled along the, the connections of these habits on a daily basis and may not be able to take a step back and consider thinking or feeling or reacting differently. So just quickly, when we are talking about a habit in our brain, what's actually happening is there's a series of connections. So the image behind this slide um, I chose because to me it kind of represents um, what uh, all the connections in your brain sort of look like. There's thousands and thousands of connections in our brain um, and each um, action is um, formed by, or sorry, each habit is formed by a series of actions sparking along um, a single connection or pathway in the brain. Um, and so in order to form a new habit or change the way that we think about ourselves, we have to actually physically, on a physical level, in our neurons, break that old chain and start building a new one with new connections. Um, and so there's actually quite a bit of, of physical change that happens on, on the level of our, of our physical brain. Um, and it's really interesting, I think, to consider it that way. It gives us an appreciation for the fact that these changes don't happen overnight um, and that we need to be aware of how our habits of thinking may be holding us in certain habits of behavior. 
So looking back over all these sort of different aspects of self-awareness and different things that we need to be aware of, there's a real kind of overreaching um, tip or, or concept uh, that I have for you guys in terms of bringing self-awareness, and that is to ask lots of questions. So first of all, it's this idea of asking questions of yourself, questioning your thoughts, questioning why you're thinking that way, questioning why you're reacting that way, questioning your beliefs, seeing if you can figure out what your beliefs are behind your thoughts, um, questioning those beliefs then and, and asking yourself if they're limiting you or not. Um, and really what's behind this process is kind of this, um, this need to stop assuming that, um, that we 100% understand our own thoughts and, and feelings, because um, most people don't 100% <laughs> understand why they think or feel the way that they do. Um, however, we often, our brain does sort of a, is very good at creating meaning. And so we often come up with, our brain will sort of come up with reasons to support our thoughts and feelings. Um, but those may or may not be accurate or based in, in sort of rational thought processes. So it can be really interesting to start to question that. Um, so yeah, so the idea is just sort of stop assuming that, that you know and start asking ourselves more. And it's almost like a self-interviewing exercise. Um, ask yourself questions as if you were talking to someone else whose brain you couldn't see inside and really kind of search for those answers. So what can be really helpful in this process is to actually work with someone. So that someone could be a coach or a friend or someone like myself uh, with training in psychology and um, in this type of work um, to sort of facilitate this, uh, this question asking process. And this can be really valuable because um, we all have blind spots about ourselves and we can't see what we can't see. <laughs> we can't see, we can't know what we can't know. And so it can be very interesting to engage in this process with the help of, of another person um, who either knows you well or, or has the appropriate training to sort of help tease out your own blind spots around your own self-awareness. And um, the second part of this idea around questions is really important when we consider um, helping other people develop self-awareness. So um, really, for, of course, it's always important to engage in this process ourselves, but I think a lot of you are probably personal trainers or coaches, um, and you're probably thinking, okay, well, how can I also help my clients build this sort of level of self-awareness around themselves? And once again, it comes down to questions. Asking people questions, first of all, is an amazing way to build trust and build likability. People love to feel that you are interested in them, and there's no better way to do that than to ask lots of questions. Um, but further than that, it's this idea of asking people, not telling them. So what we really want to do is facilitate that other person on their own or to either undertake or to move along their own journey of, of um, self-awareness building or self-discovery. Um, you can, it's, we're never sort of qualified to tell another person about themselves and that can often create a lot of defensiveness um, over uh, sort of fear or anxiety in the other person. And so what's much more effective is to use questions to just get the other person thinking about their own reaction, thinking about um, how they feel about something, thinking about uh, what they want to do, what their goals are, what their values are, why they're undertaking this um, this journey of you know physical or, or mental change uh, with you as their personal trainer. And by doing that, you're really facilitating them um, to solve the problem and, and sort of learn it for themselves as opposed to pushing the information at them. And what we find is that people are much more engaged in the learning process um, if they feel like they are sort of solving the problems and coming up with the answers themselves, as opposed to being sort of told what the answer is. All right, so um, for those of you who were here last week, you'll remember this slide. Um, and this really ties into the idea that if we, if you are interested in, in sort of taking on any of the information from this webinar and really creating some immediate change or immediate um, shifts in your own life, that it's very important to take these three steps. 
um, before you walk away from this webinar. We're all really, really busy despite uh, the COVID-19 situation. Everyone's got lots of stuff going on in their lives. And the way that habits work is that we're much more likely to absorb a lot of inf new information and then sort of just carry on the way that we were doing things before. And again, it comes down to the strengths of those habits. And so if we want to engage in habit change, we need to consciously sort of identify the things that we do want to change. Give yourself um, a starting point for when you're going to start these new behaviors or these thoughts. And, um, and then it can be very, very useful to identify someone who can hold you accountable for that change. And that just means sort of letting someone else know what you're doing um, why you're doing it and sort of with a time frame that you're hoping to accomplish that in and then that person can kind of become your accountability buddy where they can you can ask them to sort of check in with you or you can um, check in with them yourself to keep you accountable to that um, decided behavior change um, also the sort of other side of accountability is is also to just sort of be accountable to yourself and one really great way to do that is to engage in some journaling and sort of by writing down the things and using the journal as a, as a place for self-reflection and, and um, a sort of a medium for building self-awareness you're also in sort of a tangible physical way through writing um, creating some self-accountability Okay, so um, if any of you are interested in learning more about this beyond the scope of this webinar, um, I have um, the offer, or I'm able to deliver one to one training and also group training um, for personal trainers and gym owners. So feel free to contact me if you are interested in um, kind of taking a deeper look at um, these concepts and really zeroing in on how you can apply it to yourself and your clients and, and your business. Um, alternatively, alternatively, if you have, if you're a personal trainer or gym owner and you have a client who is really interested in this stuff and is looking to dive in. Um, a deeper level than you sort of feel comfortable or um, facilitating or maybe um, that you have the time to facilitate, um, please again feel free to get in touch with me and um, the beauty of, of the psychology work is that it can be done uh, virtually so it could be a really interesting way to help your clients fill, your time, fill their time um, while they're sort of dealing with this interesting challenge um, or potentially sort of upskill staff or create a new level of awareness around your, your business before hopefully everything gets back, gets back to normal. Um, also, I'd really love to hear from you guys about whether or not you found this material interesting um, or useful. Um, if you apply it with your clients and you think it was great and it worked, I'd love to hear about it. It's always fantastic to hear what's working for people and what's not. Um, so don't hesitate to get in touch. So we'll just finish with this quote here. So um, self-awareness gives you the capacity to learn from your mistakes as well as your successes, and it enables you to keep growing. So it really ties into the, to the concept of growth or fixed mindset that we covered last week. And without self-awareness, um, we're not really able to, once again, take a step back, look at our situations, and um, react in a really um, helpful way as opposed to an unhelpful way so it's really the key to that growth and that sense of moving forward so I really encourage everybody to um, use some of this time that we have now uh, in this situation to really think a little bit and, and about our self-awareness and see what you can develop um, to help you move forward out of this event so I'll leave this contact information up again for anyone who wants to reach out to me um, across any of these platforms, please go ahead. I love, love interacting with people and, and hearing about their experiences or the challenges that, that they're facing. Um, and what we'll do now is just like last week, we'll just move over into um, the questions phase. And I'm here for the next half hour for anyone. If, if people do have questions, fire away. All right. So. We'll just look here. Could you please put week one resources at a place we can access and download? Um, yeah, Mark, I think what I can do is ask um, my co-facilitator to send those resources out to the email list. Um, so I will I will pursue that. Um, alternatively, I don't think I can add them to this webinar at this point, but I'm, I'm quite sure that we can we can get that out. And I'll take down your name here, Mark, so that we can try to specifically get those to you um, and to anyone else who maybe missed them last week. So that's great. And uh, would you recommend a book around the habits of thoughts or feelings? Um, 
There is actually a really um, handy small bookmark um, written by Dr. Celine Mullins. So I'll just write that into the answer here called Maximizing Brain Potential. Oops. By Dr. Celine Mullins. And this is a great little book because it is um, quite short and easy to digest. Um, and it's also quite cheap, so you can um, access it online if you go to, this is her website here, adaptistraining.com. Um, you'll be able to get a link to that book there, it's like 10 euros or something. But she, she really works through the concepts of, of habits and how that influences not just our behaviors, but our thoughts and feelings and how that's all linked together. So that's great. Perfect. So, not seeing any, oh, sorry, here we go. Scott, athlete has low self-esteem, but clear core beliefs as to where they want to be as an athlete. How would you go about working with them on their esteem to help them achieve their goals? Okay, so I would say that um, when we're talking about where an athlete wants to go, that probably means that they have a really clear set of, um, or they have a clear kind of uh, goal process and they're very clear on the journey that they want to go on. Um, but when we're talking about core beliefs as related to their, if they have low self-esteem, probably what's happening is that athlete in fact has some core beliefs that are blocking them from going along that journey, even though the um, the journey is, is clearly mapped out and they're really clear on where they want to go. If they have low self-esteem, there's probably a, um, a core belief there that, that's limiting them. So usually when we have low self-esteem, the, the core beliefs are related to um, their ability. Um, so it could be that they're not athletic enough. Um, again, I'm, I'm not sure which sport we're talking about here, but um, it can be their ability to work in a team. It can be around their ability to their own motivation. Um, it's, it, it's, it's often different for, for other people. And so what I will say is that, oh, sorry, um, Matt, I will send this to everyone here. Hopefully that works there. Okay, um, so back to the core belief. So it's different for everyone, but, um, what I would recommend is to actually, first of all, try to figure out what are the thoughts that are popping into their head that are around low self-esteem? What are they saying to themselves? And then trace those thoughts back and try to identify those core beliefs. Um, and that is something that's sort of separate from that goal setting process. So by getting clear on those beliefs um, and then helping that athlete see how they're limiting them is a really good first step to help them achieve their goals. Okay, so any tips for dealing with someone who claims to have a goal, in this case, improve mobility, but then shows no motivation to do anything about it, short daily walk, even when they have plenty of time? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting one. So um, we do often see this, actually, where that person um, has probably, they probably legitimately do have that goal, um, but there is something going on that's that's blocking them from engaging in that activity and to me that usually comes down to kind of an identity issue so this person is probably struggling to sort of see themselves as someone who engages in this type of activity um, and I don't know what's what's causing them to have low mobility in the first place but if, if the mobility was a result of a lifetime of being inactive um, then we can definitely see how that person could have formed a lot of sort of core beliefs around the, who they're who they are in relation to activity and their ability to actually engage in activity successfully and their um, ability to change their habits so once again this comes down to facilitating um, a little bit of self-discovery with that person through asking them a ton of questions just keep asking them questions you know how do they feel about the walk is there anywhere that anything about it that this change that feels hard for them? What's stressing them out? Why is that? Why is that stressing them out? Probably to the two most powerful questions you can ask once you've gotten into the conversation is why, um, and just keep asking that. <laughs> and then the other one is to say.
feel that they should give or they give the answer that they feel they're supposed to give a couple of times before they maybe actually get down to the answer that's that's really true and at the root of the situation. So just keep keep asking questions and encourage them to to really take a look at, at that. Um, okay. My screen is going crazy here. Okay, um, so that's great. Matt's got the link there, perfect. Okay. Um, hi, Jennifer. So, oops. <laughs> Sorry, my screen keeps jumping down. I lose the question. Okay, how do you feel about the thought that sometimes a fear of failure can actually be a fear of success? Because if we do succeed, then we are no longer able to make excuses about thinking that we are not good enough. I heard this from Phil Mansfield of Red Pill Training and thought it was quite interesting. Yeah, um, I agree with that, Jennifer. I think that um, there can be um, a real, there's a real courage in letting go of excuses. There's a lot of courage required to let go of excuses. Um, and so I don't know if people fear um, success, but I would definitely agree that people fear the process of um, letting go of all excuses around what's holding them back and really like owning um, what they need to do in order to be successful. Um, so I think that's kind of what Phil's probably getting at with that statement and I, and I would um, agree with that 100%. Um, there's certainly a lot of courage involved in that. Great. Um, down to Carl here. Um, any tips to my current situation where I've been in the military for 10 years and suffering PTSD using physical exercise as an escape, but now currently injured? Oh, that's really tough, yeah. So I've lost a lot of motivation to get back on the horse as to try and uh, to train, not reaching it of my previous markers. Yeah, that can be so challenging. And um, the injury is such a setback for, for, for so many people in so many different contexts because it, it takes away our sense of control. Um, and one of the wonderful things about using physical act activity um, and exercise as a way to cope with something like PTSD or, or to cope with, with another challenge is that it, it allows us to kind of regain a sense of control of our, over our, our own ability to um, help ourselves. And then the injury can sort of sideline that and take away that sense of control. So um, my advice for you, Carl, would be to um, sort of, you have to go through a process of, of resetting your goals or re-evaluating uh, your goals. Um, and so what we may need to do is to temporarily let go of, of the previous markers that we had pre-injury and identify um, a different set of markers for yourself. So what we know about goal setting is that it's really important that our goals are always realistic and achievable so that we can in fact get to them. The, the, the experience of achieving a goal, even if it's a really small one, is very motivating and helps us then um, get the motivation to move on again to the next goal. So if we're struggling with motivation, what we wanna do is really scale the goal back to something really small, really achievable, really tangible. Um, so that we can get ourselves those kind of small wins and small successes and that will start to positively affect your motivation and give you that sense of control back so that you can start to tackle then those those bigger goals again um, and don't be afraid to, don't forget to to sort of embrace the fact that as with all injury it is going to take time and that um, if we look at it as a setback, we can also see it as an opportunity to potentially learn something else. So this could be um, an opportunity for you to maybe learn to train in a slightly different way, engage a slightly different form of activity, which could actually end up making you stronger overall um, moving forward. And um, don't hesitate to reach out if, if you wanna discuss that more um, independently. Um, Mark, I found the suggestion helpful about trying the goal to tying the goal to the person we want to be. Um, again, any more resources around that would be helpful. Um, yeah, absolutely, Mark. I mean, there. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I don't think that there is a specific book or um, uh, the person, author that I can think of who really focuses on that concept. It's something that comes up a lot in, in, in literature and books around goal setting. Um, so what I would recommend is to potentially even just fire into Google, you know, goals and identity. And a lot of, a lot of resources will in fact pop up um, that talk more about that. Um, 
or alternatively, if you want to reach out to me on one of the one of the social media platforms, then I can follow up with you um, personally with, with some more resources. Unfortunately, I don't have anything at my fingertips at this moment um, specifically for that other than, than, a, than a quick Google search. But it is a common theme throughout goal setting um, literature and, and writings. And so it shouldn't be too hard to find more about that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the great questions, guys. It's it's um it's wonderful to to be able to um, engage with you guys and and offer a few few personalized tips. Uh, it's really great. Okay, so I think that might be the last of the questions there. So I think what we'll do is is wrap it up there. Um, so the last webinar in this series will happen uh, this coming Wednesday again at 3 p.m. and it's going to be focusing in on resilience, that sort of top peak skill. Um, and now that we have the, the, some of the foundational knowledge built up, we're just going to be talking around sort of what is resilience and uh, what we can do to uh, really pull it all together and facilitate that in ourselves and in our, in our clients and, and um, those around us. Um, so once again, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me across any of these platforms um, or if you're interested in working with me in any capacity moving forward after this webinar. I'm always interested in in um, meeting people and, and hearing about their their experiences and um, and stories. And thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a real pleasure hanging out with you guys again today. And thank you so much to Blackbox for um, facilitating this with me. So we'll see you see you all soon. Enjoy your week. And uh, I hope very much that things continue to to settle for everybody as we move forward through this. All right. Take care, guys.